Good evening, I'm Maine Castillo. I'm Town Hall's Program Manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with neuroscientist, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett and New York Times editor, James Ryerson. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization, a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Lisa and James for appearing tonight to help make this possible. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content this season, including our podcast, In the Moment, which features exclusive guests. And many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Elizabeth Furr with Laura Anderson Barbata, sharing Latinx photography and asking why these artists have been excluded from American photography history. Data analysis, Alberto Carrillo discusses how the vi ver visualization of data can be misleading. And authors Donna Miskolta and Cecilia Argon in conversation about overcoming the struggles of gender and racial bias for Latina women. Check out more of what's in store on our on online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the ever-changing landscape. We hope you'll consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation and becoming a member. Click on the donate button at the bottom of your screen at any time. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak as well and could use your support. We encourage you to support local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight. Use the link on this live stream page to purchase through Elliott Bay Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about an hour, including Q&A. James will select from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. We will also take questions from those submitted in the YouTube chat. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arnold Matulski Science Series James is Ryerson. supported by Microsoft, KUOW, Wincoat Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Lisa Feldman Barrett, PhD is a professor of psychology. She is a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University with appointments at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. She is also an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Royal Society of Canada. She has received numerous scientific awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and an NIH Director's Pioneer Award, and is the author of How Emotions Are Made, published in 2017. In addition to her two books, Dr. Barrett has published over 240 peer-reviewed scientific papers appearing in Science, Nature, Neuroscience, and other top journals in Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience. She also has six academic volumes published by Gulfoil Press. Her popular TED Talk titled, You Aren't at the Mercy of Your Emotions, has nearly 6 million views. Dr. Barrett has testified before Congress, presented her research to the FBI, consulted to the National Cancer Institute, and has been featured and has been a featured guest on public television and podcasts and radio programs worldwide. James Ryerson has been an editor at the New York Times since 2003. Since First at the Sunday Magazine and now at the Opinion Pages. Before that, he was an editor at Legal Affairs, Lingua Franca, and Feed. He writes on philosophy, science, and other academic topics, and has written introductory chapters for books like Fate, Time, and Language, an essay on Free Will by David Foster Wallace, and Take Care of Freedom and Truth Will Take Care of Itself, interviews with Richard Rorty.
He is a fellow of the New York Institute of Humanities and was a Coleman Fellow at the New York Public Library in 2012 and 2013. In 2018, he was given the Excellence in Science Journalism Award from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. Barrett's book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, just released this fall, is a topic of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Feldman Barrett and James Ryerson. Hi, thank you so much for the nice introduction, Lisa. It's great to see you. Wonderful to see you too, Jamie. I'm looking forward to talking a little bit and then opening this up to uh, all the audience members. Thank you guys for, for coming and, and being interested. Um, so you've written a, uh, a book. Here it is. Um, <laughs> seven and a half lessons about the brain. It is a um, it's a short work of popular science. It's sort of a um, neuroscientific beach read, if you will. It's uh, a handful of um, short essays about the brain, each one of which can be read in a single sitting. Uh, the book itself can probably be read in a weekend if if you have the time. Um, so my question for you is this: This is not the standard way in which academics write. Um, indeed, it's it's not even the standard way in which academics write when they're writing for a popular audience. Um, so why did you decide to write about the brain in this particular format? I like to be different. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are a number of reasons why. Maybe the top two are, um, I love essays. I love mm. reading essays. Um, and I, was particularly struck by a little book of essays written by Anne Fadiman a number of years ago called At Large and At Small. It was a really mm -hmm. small book um, of little familiar essays. And I thought it would be really interesting to try to write something like a familiar essay, but about the brain, mm -hmm. where, you know, people could read an essay on a subway, you know, from uh, on a couple of subway stops, like the, the time it takes to get from one subway uh, stop to another or, or on the beach or in the evening before bed, perhaps learn a couple of tidbits uh, about neuroscience that are really fun and interesting where they could dazzle their friends, you know, at a dinner party um, or over Zoom. Um, and, but where the, these little tidbits would leave um, people thinking, where people would come away with ideas or thoughts about human nature that that would leave them thinking um, for for a while, actually. And mm. that that that's really the other reason why I wrote it, because I think science, science and philosophy are tools for living, and that's I've always really believed that, and um, not necessarily in a in a self-help way, although certainly in that way, but mm -hmm. also they're guidelines for how to treat each other, how to think to think about how, you know who, what kind of a person do you want to be in this world? How do you want to what? How do you want to be in the world? You know, and um, that was really the goal: is to try to link the science to these larger questions um, of of living. I see, and you know, you you. You talk about having the essays uh, relay little um, delightful kind of uh, tidbits of neuroscientific information, and it does that. But one striking thing about the book um, is its um, contrarianism uh, in a certain way, right? Like you, you might see this book, uh, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, and think, oh, this is going to be a kind of refresher course of all the stuff that I once learned about the brain uh, but have now forgotten, or stuff that I was supposed to learn about the brain but I never did uh, in my high school class or my college class or something like that. But um, it's it's not really like that at all. It's, it's it, The book challenges a lot of kind of what I think of as kind of um, commonsensical kind of assumptions or positions about the brain, um, about what kinds of thing the, the brain is and how it works and so forth. Um, uh, if you had to pick, um, what is the maybe the most important uh, misunderstanding about the brain that you feel needs to be corrected in the in the popular kind of understanding of how the brain works? Yeah, um, I think that probably the most pervasive misunderstanding is that your brain is a battleground for your inner beast, like emotions and instincts versus mm -hmm. rationality, and that there are parts of your brain for um, emotion, parts of your brain 
for rationality. The two are in a battle, lifelong battle over the control of your behavior. Um, and uh, when you know emotionality gets the better of your rational side, um, then your behavior is either immoral or mentally ill, depending on which narrative you you um, you subscribe to. And that this morality um, play also has been taken up in Western thought as an origin story of of the human condition of human nature and it's a it's a profoundly western view of mm. the human mind and in the in the mid 20th century it kind of got tattooed onto the brain <laughs> as a way of understanding so? brain evolution i'm sorry how so what do you mean by it got tattooed onto the um, brain well, I think that what happened was that scientists, neuroscientists in the mid 20th century used the tools that they had available to them um, to look at, you know, a lizard brain or a reptile brain um, and versus, a, you know, say a rodent brain um, uh, versus a primate brain or a human brain. And they noticed that um, the brains looked very different on the surface. Mm. And um, this led to this idea that, you know, that the way that that the brain evolved was really we have reptiles and lizards who have instincts and then layered on top of that um you know is the um the limbic system limbic meaning border so new regions that border those instincts that are really for emotion that you see in in mammals like um like rats and um dogs and cats and so on and then in primates and particularly in humans, you have overlaid on top of that this um, very large cerebral cortex for rationality. So it's kind of like a layer cake view mm -hmm. of the brain, and that was the, that is the view actually in the public mind of. And so you you read all this stuff in in articles and in in leadership training programs and. Um, and in lots and lots of textbooks, actually, you know, about how um, your limbic system or your amygdala hijacks your brain and causes you to do, you know, kind of unfortunate things. And the whole thing is a myth. It's a mm. really successful myth. I think in some ways, because this is a cherished view of, uh, of human morality, um, it, it, it's probably one of the most successful scientific myths, I think, that, um, you know, certainly of the modern age, uh, but it's completely wrong um, from a scientific standpoint, like not even a grain of truth to it. Um, so I find that really, really fascinating. And it's um, also, and, and, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's, no, no. it's, not, it's not just that this comes down from, uh, uh, kind of cultural inheritance, although I think in the in, in maybe in the West it does, but maybe because I'm someone who grew up in the West, it introspectively it feels true, right? I it it feels like there are some reactions that I have that are just reflexive and incredibly primal. Like I think I see a snake and I jump. And then there's some reactions that feel a little warmer but still kind of out of my control, like anger or fear or something like that and then it does feel like sometimes I'll sit down with my wife and talk about why I was so angry at work and I'll feel like I can kind of get some perspective on it and and my rationality has kind of gotten control of me again or something like that but you're saying that that kind of introspective narrative just does not map onto anything we're seeing in the brain or how it works or something like that yeah look every day after dinner I, I have the experience the exactly what you're talking about you mm. know there's chocolate in the cupboard I've just finished dinner. You know, it feels to me like my inner beast is having a major struggle uh, with my with my rational self. <laughs> but the really cool thing about the human brain, or one of the really cool things, is that it's a master of deception. You know, because our brain creates for us this really rich experience, as well as the confidence that this experience reveals how it works. Um, and it doesn't, you know, like we, re we experience the world also in very um, reactive terms, like, you know, that our eyes and ears and so on are just windows on the world mm -hmm. and that um, we're stimulated by stuff around us. And then we react to that stuff. And that's how it feels to us a lot of the time. But that's actually the opposite of what's happening in your brain. All brains certainly our brains, but all brains work predictably, actually. Um, they're not 
they don't sit around off being stimulated by the world. Brains are always predicting all the time. Um, and then um, correcting. So prediction, correction, prediction, correction. So your brain is planning your actions, planning your experience, what it will be in the next moment. Um, and then getting sense data from sights and sounds and so on from the world and from your body. And those sense data um, either confirm the predictions or, or correct them. So it's exactly the opposite of what, how we experience things. Um, similarly, we experience our, the way that we, the, the sort of um, temporal sequence that we experience things in is that we see something or hear something and then we react with a behavior. Mm -hmm. But actually under the hood, the, when your brain is predicting what, if we were to stop time right now, just stop time mm -hmm. and look at everybody's brains, like look at your brain, for example, your brain would be representing what just happened in the world and in your body and making a prediction about what's going to happen next. The last time I was in this situation, in this state, what did I hear next, see next, feel next, and do next? But the first prediction is what do I do next? Your brain actually, the first thing it does is make a prediction about what needs to happen in your body and what you experience is a consequence of that prediction. So in your brain, it's action first, experience second. But because of the time lag for how long things take, we we get experience first and action second. Right, right. So so introspection in that sense is an extremely unreliable uh, guide to what's actually going on in the brain. Um, in I would fact, say almost always. Yeah, I would say almost always introspection is an extremely <laughs> unreliable guide to what is happening in the brain, yeah. Well, related to that, the, the, your book is called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, and there is a half lesson that opens the book um, that um, the, the lesson has the slogan, your brain is not for thinking, um, which uh, also sounds sort of counterintuitive and, um, and, uh, and not necessarily uh, introspectively what you feel like your mental life uh, or your neural life is all about. If I think about my brain, I think, oh, this must be the thing that's responsible for all these thoughts I'm having, these sensations that I'm aware of, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, what does it mean that my brain is not for thinking? Yeah, so, you know, one of the ways that, um, one of the ways that human values creep into science is that scientists who are human, obviously, really value the things that they think set humans apart from other animals. Hmm. And in the West, one of the things that we value quite a bit is rational thought. We, we value thinking. And so we, we think of that as our, our like sort of our ult the ultimate ability that we have that, you know, other animals don't have. Um, and so it, it seems like you know evolution kind of pointed itself at us and said, "Oh, you know, these are the these are the pinnacle, the creatures at the pinnacle," mm -hmm. and um, you know, and thinking is at the top of that of that list of like great things that humans can do. Um, but brains, you know, brains didn't evolve for thinking. Evolution didn't aim itself at us, and um, and. You know, we are, we certainly can do some pretty special things, um, but so can a lot of other animals. Um, you know, a lot of animals can do stuff that we can't do, that we endow our superheroes with, you know, on TV and in movies, um, like, you know, growing back limbs and being able to, um, you know, carry 50 times our own body weight and climb up walls and so on and so forth. The thing is that our, our brains actually did evolve to, to do a really cool thing. It's just the really cool thing that is our brain's most important job is also the most important job of every other brain on this planet, um, which is to control the systems of our body. So if you go all the way back to a time in um, the earth when creatures didn't have brains, I, I personally find this just the story of like, why do we even have a brain? Mm -hmm. Really, really fascinating. Because um, brains are really expensive organs. I mean, that three pound blob of meat between your ears is 20% of your metabolic budget. That's, that's the most expensive organ you have in your entire body. Um, and 
So why have, why spend that much? Like why, what, what does it give you? And the answer is you have a very complicated body and it has a lot of systems in it. And all of those systems need glucose and water and salt and oxygen. And, um, and so how does, how would you, you know, how would a system work where you have all these parts and they all need the same resources? There has to be some balance there. How do you get that balance? How do you decide who gets what when? Mm -hmm. um, and so at, in over evolutionary time, bodies got bigger and um, environments, the, the environments that animals lived in, the parts of the environment that were important to them called a niche got larger. Um, and brains, little clumps of cells, um, really evolved into into brains. So the, your brain's most important job is um, running the systems of your body in a metabolically efficient way. And you, the things that you think and you feel and you see and you hear, are in the service of running that body efficiently. That's not how it feels to you or to me or to anybody else, but that is actually what's happening um, under the hood. So, so what you're saying is, so the first part of what you're saying sounds somewhat intuitive, although maybe a little surprising, which is, you know, the brain really evolved to manage the needs of the body. Um, and so a lot of what it's doing, you're not even aware of at a conscious level. Um, that's sort of surprising, but I can kind of make sense of that. But then you're also saying that even the stuff that I'm conscious of, my feelings and my thoughts and my visual perceptions and everything, a lot of that stuff is much more in the service of m maintaining my body's needs uh, than I'm aware of. Oh, for sure, actually. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we aren't, right now, as you're sitting there quietly, having a conversation with me. In fact, everyone who's sitting, listening to us have a conversation, um, you know, inside each person's body, there is a, you know, a real drama going on that, that we're pretty much each of us is largely unaware of. And if you're not unaware of that drama, if you're aware of it, I feel real, I'm sorry. Like I, I, I have great, great empathy for you. Um, you know, philosophers call this tragic embodiment. Um, the idea that, um, the moment we become aware of what's going on inside our own bodies in any kind of detail that rivals vision, um, like the detail of vision, that's going to be super unpleasant and mm -hmm. distracting. Um, so, so much going on. Because there's so much going on. Yeah, I once heard a philosopher give this well, Give lecture. an example of what you're talking about. Well, what yeah, kinds yeah. of things? Yeah. yeah, so I, I'm going to give you like what seems like a trivial example, and then I'll move to something more dramatic. But um, like a trivial example is, I, except I thought it was a brilliant example. I heard a philosopher once give a, give a lecture, and she was talking about how um, she was in the kitchen cooking and listening to a very tragic story on the radio about an airplane crash that had killed 200 plus people. And as she was listening to this story, she was peeling something with a knife and the knife slipped and just you know nicked her finger and her entire attention went to her finger she stopped listening to the story she was completely consumed by the sensations of the cut and the way she described it she's which i thought was really compelling she said you know i wasn't making a more my attention the the attentional grab of that discomfort wasn't like a moral stance on the fact that my little cut on my finger was more important than the 200 plus people who died, but I couldn't disengage my attention from the, the discomfort in my finger. And I, I guess what I would say is, um, you know, think of the last time you had GI distress. Like think of the last time you had an ache in your hip or your knee or, you know, any kind of persistent sensation that is vivid in your body really grabs your attention and 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 makes it difficult to pay attention to what's going on around you outside in the world or a migraine headache for example or anything that um, involves physical um, sensation um, that is uncomfortable and that's because we're we're really largely not aware of all the the flows and tugs and like all the stuff going on inside our own bodies 
Um, for anyone who's interested in in getting a tiny bit of a sense of that, you know, go to a flotation, um, go go into a flotation tank where um, like they have these sensory deprivation tanks, which I think they're, it's funny that it's called that, but you know, you they put you in complete darkness. They put um, earphones in your in your ear so you can't hear anything. They um, they match the temperature of the room to your body temperature. You get into a tub where you're floating in, you know, salt water that is sort of akin to the, you know, mm -hmm. like um, the Dead Sea. And after a few minutes, there's no exteroceptive sensations, no sights, no sounds, no smells, like nothing to, to distract your attention away from the orchestra that mm. is going on inside your own body. And it's remarkable, like it's just, the first time I did it, and I knew something about, you know, internal Electric systems. Back, yeah. I was in that tub for an hour and a half. Like, I just couldn't believe the drama. <laughs> it was like a, like, you know, like an opera, really. Um, and so, you know, we're not, we, we have to go to like all these extreme or, or, you know, the first time I was ever kicked in the liver when I was pregnant. I mean, that was a, that was a moment of a great epiphany <clears throat> since I had never actually been kicked in the, I don't even know it was my liver. It could have been my gallbladder or my stomach. Yeah. I have no idea, but you know, we're just not used to, um, you know, we don't have a lot of a, uh, precision about the sensations that we get from our own bodies, but it is going on all the time. And what's really interesting is that the parts of the brain that are involved in regulating um, mm -hmm. The systems of our body are also the parts of the brain that are important for memory and for processing language and for perceiving, you know, making guesses and inferences about what other people are, are thinking and feeling and even influencing not just how much you see, but also what you see. So it turns out that the your ability your brain's ability to sample the visual world is yoked to your heart rate <laughs> so you know your heart takes in blood pumps out blood takes in blood pumps out blood well it turns out that your brain's um sampling of the visual world that is what you see is influenced by that um that cycle we're completely unaware that this is true, but it is happening all the time. And right. it's actually really important for understanding things, you know, that happen sometimes in the world where people miss see things, for example, and it's really puzzling why they would miss see something. And the answer really lies in understanding the dynamics between this conversation between the brain and the body. So it's not just that your brain is very busy managing this incredibly complicated bodily stuff that you can feel in a sensory deprivation tank, but are otherwise um, not particularly aware of, um, and that your thoughts are kind of operating on their own, but that your thoughts and perceptions and feelings are somehow operating on your own while your body's being busy keeping itself alive, but that those two things are kind of constantly overlapped and intertwined, um, and that everything from perception to emotions to feelings and thoughts are just as bound up with blood flow and breathing rates and uh, sugar levels and everything else as, as just basic body maintenance might be. Yeah, and in fact, because we um, don't, you know, have really high fidelity sensations coming from the body that we can, that we're aware of, instead evolution has um, given us a different way of keeping track of what's going on inside the body. And that is um, what is colloquially known as mood or mm. what scientists call affect, which is this continual stream of feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling kind of worked up or feeling kind of calm. Um, basically, you know, when things are going well in your body and your brain is regulating your body well, um, you know, you feel kind of good you feel like everything's okay. And when there's a problem there, when there's a metabolic deficit, um, you know, sometimes I speak about um, the technical term is allostasis, that, that your brain is performing on your body, is um, trying to anticipate the needs of the body and meet those needs before they arise. But I sort of talk about it as, you know, your brain running a budget for your body and you can make 
deposits and withdrawals into that budget, you know, in terms of energy and water and sleep and so on. Um, and so when you're running a deficit, you, you know, you feel kind of crappy. And there's nothing specific about these feelings. And they, these feelings are not emotions. They're really more simple physical feelings that are with you kind of all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and your brain sometimes makes sense of them as emotions when they when your brain ties those feelings to what is going on around you in the world um, uh, and um, creates a, a kind of a reason for those feelings um, that guides your actions. Those are emotions. And sometimes your brain takes those feelings and embeds them in perceptions of the world, like this is a delicious drink. That is a beautiful painting. That isn't, you know, a nice guy or that asshole just cut me off on the highway. Um, you know, that is affect or feeling being embedded as a feature or a property of the object that you're perceiving, uh, perceiving as opposed to uh, you, you experiencing it as a, a property of your own, um, of your own, con your own feeling. So right, these right. little, these feelings are like properties of consciousness. They're kind of always with us all the time. Okay. So that brings me to another question I have. So, so again, one might think approaching a book about the brain that it's going to be about the experience of reading this book is going to be a lot about like reading about a com big computer um, that has a lot of computational power um, and information information processing power. And of course, the brain does have have computational information processing power. But one thing that's really striking about the book is you start to realize how much all of the things we think of as thinking are, are kind of intertwined with the body. But then the other thing that's surprising, although it's very related, is that there's a lot of discussion in the book about things like um, friendship and child rearing. Um, why would a book about the brain focus so much on things like friendships, enemies, child rearing? Because, um, because first of all, uh, an infant brain is not a miniature adult brain. It's a brain that is born waiting for a set of wiring instructions from the world. An infant cannot manage its own body. So cannot manage its, it cannot make deposits and withdrawals into its own, you know, into its, well, it can make withdrawals, but it can't make deposits into its own body budget. So when you, um, uh, feed a child and when you, um, you know, uh, keep a child warm or, you know, cool the child off or change the child's diapers and so on, really what you're doing is you're managing that baby's body budget. And that management, that's not how it feels to you, but that management actually um, is helping to wire the baby's brain um, to uh, for the baby's brain to eventually take over body budgeting, that body budgeting responsibility, um, uh, him or herself. And actually many of the social things that we do with babies are also wiring instructions for the baby's brain. So um, making eye contact with the baby, for example, helps the baby learn what is signal and what is noise, like what sights and sounds and smells and so on are important and which ones can be ignored. Um, talking to the baby, cuddling the baby, like all of these things, not just the physical things we do for a baby, but also the, the social things we do have a direct impact on the baby's body budget in the moment, but also the brain is learning um, to, uh, the basically the brain is tuning and pruning itself to be able to manage that baby's body budget essentially on its own to some extent. Um, so, you know, we have the kind of nature that requires nurture. Brains require this input. And that kind of, you know, um, collaborative body budgeting, while it decreases somewhat, never stops. Meaning mm -hmm. right now, Jamie, you know, even though we are hundreds of miles apart, um, we are in the process of conversation. We are managing, you and I are managing each other's body budgets. How so? Um, well, words, well, first of all, um, if we were in the same room, our brains would be, because we like each other, I think, and we trust each other, because um, we've known each other for a little while now, 
um, our brains would synchronize our breathing and our heart rate. And to some extent, some of that information is available over Zoom. You're not aware of it, but, and it's actually easier for you to see my breathing than it is for me to see yours. Although I can see it if I, my brain is certainly tracking it unbeknownst to me, but if I look really closely, I can see some movement that lets me know how you're breathing. And by coordinating breathing, that coordinates our heartbeats to some extent. So there's some physical coordination that people, that happens when you just put people in a conversation. But words also are, remember how I said that the systems, some of the parts of your brain that are involved in controlling your body also are important for understanding um, and speaking words. And words are a really important way that humans impact each other's body budgets, right? So um, I could say a couple of things that could change your breathing and your heart rate and all the other systems in your body pretty quickly. Um, and you could do the same for me. I could text three little words to my best friend who lives halfway across the world and I can change her metabolism, you know, like that um, in either direction, frankly. Um, so. I, the point here is that, you know, we are social animals. Humans evolved to be social animals. And that means that our nervous systems are somewhat coordinated. We are the caretakers of each other's nervous systems. That's definitely true for infants, um, but it's even true for, for adults. And what that means is that, you know, the best thing for a human nervous system is another human. And the worst thing for a human nervous system can also be another human. We have these really entwined, um, dependent, biologically dependent nervous systems. Um, and we um, we live in a in a in a country and in a culture that values individual rights and freedoms, and sometimes those things seriously conflict with each other. So this leads me to one other question, and then I think um, I'll turn it over to questions from the audience. Um, so this idea that, uh, you know, starting in infancy, the human brain is kind of highly dependent, the human organism and the human brain are highly dependent on its kind of caretaker, and that though that becomes less uh, extreme as time goes on, it never really goes away, that kind of interdependence and mutual interdependence for 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 good and for ill a great parent can really help a child a highly negligent parent can really hurt a child um even a I, mildly I, negligent parent can really hurt a child unfortunately <laughs> so yeah you know but um what the, the the obvious contrast that leaps to mind is with say like a horse or some other mammal where you know the 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 horse the baby horse is born and like that, you know, within a very, very short period of time. I don't yeah, know what it is. Like means. an hour. A week or an yeah. hour or a month. It's yeah. pretty much acting like an adult horse. Um, you know, right. there's not a huge amount of difference between the adult and the baby after six months, I don't think. But certainly within like a few hours, right, you start to get uh, a walking horse and things like that. Now, it seems like evolutionarily, it would be advantageous to be like that to be able to get up to speed very, very quickly. But clearly with humans, there's gotta be some reason why remaining so vulnerable for so long, um, needing a caretaker for so long, being so highly sensitive to another person for so long um, benefits us in some way, right? That's gotta be some kind of advantage, but I'm not clear on what it is. Okay, well, first of all, I think the, there's a very, very clear advantage. But I mean, one thing to say is that um, the duration of, maturation of a brain like how many years does it take to sort of get a fully you know mm -hmm. a fully a fully adult brain or you know um the longer lived the animal is the longer it takes for the brain to develop that's the first thing to realize so there actually is a relationship between how long you live and um and also the size um of the brain so larger brains take longer to develop into their adult form. Why would that be the case? Well, um, I don't think anybody knows specifically, but I can say one thing that, that is very specific about humans, and that is because we have brains that wire themselves to their world, 
their physical world and their social world. That means that evolution has offloaded the development of the brain to the to the regularities in the world. So it it, it that and that produces tremendous flexibility. So everything that you your brain and your mind will become is not encoded in your genes. Right. You have the kind of genes that make you open to um, why to your brain wiring itself to the environment that is curated for you, and that allows humans to live in many, many, many different niches in many different parts of the world with many different cultures. And these cultures, so basically, what you're doing is you're in cult. You know, the brain is a cultural artifact in a sense. It's you're enculturating, embedding um, uh, knowledge, uh, the cultural knowledge um, uh, of the world into the infant's brain to be able to um, use that to live in, be in the world, in that culture and perpetuate that world. And um, so I guess the answer is we wouldn't really have civilization (laughs) and we wouldn't have many of the things that we take kind of take for granted as part of everyday life if we didn't have brains like this. Right. Um, a, but horse also, born in, a horse born in one part of the world is exactly the same as a horse born in another part of the world. Yeah, yeah, more I mean, or less, right? There's, I mean, I'm sure. Less, that, yeah. yeah I mean, Compared animals, to animals, humans, right? That it, there's a yeah, lot less variation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are other animals that have customs and, and things like that. But, and there are other animals who, you know, teach each other. Well, no, that's not true. There are other animals who learn from each other. I think we're the only species who directly. Well, no, there is there are other animals, one or two, that actually sort of teach their their offspring. It is a but it's a much bigger deal in humans than other animals. But I would say other animals modify the physical world. You know, they might build a nest or mm-hmm. they might, um, you know, um, you know, hoard food or they might, you know, they they're they're um, they're they're modifying what's physically there. Humans have the capacity to add to the world to impose functions on things in the physical world that those that those objects don't have by their physical nature it's like we can we can all decide that something is real and then poof it's real like money for example right. like and little that's pieces all, of that's all ultimately a function you're saying of this kind of de- yeah. this vulnerability dependability mutuality that goes that starts from yeah. In, 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 in extends yeah. yeah. And also, I will also add one other thing, and that is one of the one of the points that Darwin made, one of the observations that Darwin made, which is really important, is that within a species, variation is important. Variation is important because if some environmental change happens, um, like things get really cold or things get really warm, or you know, there's some like dramatic or some kind of you know some some type of food um, you know goes away or is in abundance or whatever that when there's a really big environmental change you need variation in the species in order for the species to survive Mm -hmm. and so one way to think about all of the cultural niches that humans live in all these different cultural systems you can think about this as variation in the species and um i think we you know it's not that much of a stretch to say um, for example, look at how different cultures have dealt with the COVID crisis. Different cultures have different sets of rules. Those rules, indi- you know, dictate people's behavior, and those behaviors differentially impact the spread of the virus. That's a small example of a bigger point. And where does this cultural variation come from? It comes from or at least it's the stage is set for it by the fact that babies' brains are born under construction. Fascinating. Uh, thanks so much for answering my questions. Um, let's let's see if I can uh, figure out this interface and um, get a few questions from the audience here. Um, uh, okay, so the first question here uh, comes from uh, Dwayne, and uh, it is, what is your opinion of Ian McGilchrist's thesis expressed in his book, The Master and the Emissary, that the left hemisphere is gaining dominance over the right hemisphere. Uh, Well, Dwayne, I would say that um, that 
is maybe um, when Ian McGilchrist wrote those books, he was using the best available science um, that was that scientists had, and that um, that that isn't necessarily the view of many neuroscientists today, because we have much much more evidence. So. I don't want to completely dismiss the idea that there are lateralization differences, but the traditional differences that that are in the popular um, are in popular discourse, like left brain, right brain. You know, left brain is for language, and right brain is for emotion, or you know, left brain is analytical, and right brain is intuitive, and so on. Those dichotomies don't really hold up uh, according to the best evidence that's available today. Uh, and then there's a quick follow-up question there from Angela, um, which might be worth uh, touching on as well before we move on to the next uh, itemized question, which is uh, asking you to um, correct a popular myth about the amygdala and its kind of hijacking function. Yeah, the amygdala doesn't have a hijacking function. The amygdala's job is not to is not to make you fearful. It's not to um, make you have any negative feel any negative emotion. It's not even emotion. The amygdala's job, um, and this is based on really thousands of experiments that I'm communicating to you. Some some of which are from my lab, but certainly not all. Um, uh, this is you know based on big analyses of thousands of studies. The amygdala's job, yeah, well, the amygdala doesn't have one job. It, it actually has many jobs. But if I were going to sum up what it does, um, what it does is uh, it alerts the rest of the brain when your when your brain can't when your brain can't predict very well what's going to happen next, um, either because you're in a novel situation or because you're faced with something you've never seen before or heard before, or because things are ambiguous. Um, or, um, uh, or if you need to to um, learn something new in order to predict better in, in the future, your amygdala signals to the rest of the brain that um, learning is required, basically. So that's one of its most important jobs, that there's something really, really important to, um, to learn here. Um, so for example, if you're in um, imminent threat, Sometimes your amygdala will engage, will send signals to the rest of the brain saying learn, like as your brain is, is executing and preparing an action to keep you alive, your amygdala will be um, encouraging parts of the brain to learn for the next time so that this doesn't happen to you. Um, but not always, right? So, so, and people who don't have an amygdala can feel fear. Um, they can perceive fear in other people. Um, and um, they, you know, they can learn, but it's but it's harder to learn. Um, so uh, so the amygdala is basically it's like you could think of it as a vigilance detector or like a salience beacon. Like here's something I should care about. Uh, here's something the rest of the brain should care about. Learn about it, and then it marshals the resources to help the brain do that. Gotcha. Uh, so the next question comes from Bryson and Lisa. I think this. I'd be curious. You answer, please answer this question any way you'd like. But I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit about um, some of your work on kind of emotion recognition and emotion concepts um, with respect to this question from Bryson, which is um, yeah. Bryson says, "Hi, Lisa. You keep mentioning uh, in the West, uh, and what exactly does this mean, and how is it different, uh, you know, from in the East or indigenous cultures?" Um, well, uh, first of all, in many cultures, so in, in, in the West, by the West, I mean cultures that take its, their cultural inheritance from ancient Greece and related places, um, we, divide the wor we divide the mental world into thinking and feeling. And in many cultures of the world, those are not separate. They're actually it's not like you're doing both at the same time. It's like they're just not separate. They're, just, they're not even separate categories. Um, similarly, um, uh, you know, the body. And so in our way of thinking, we separate mental illness and physical illness, mental health and physical health. We separate mental and physical things into separate bins. And in other parts of the world, 
That's just not a meaningful distinction. And so a really good example is emotion. So it, oftentimes I'm getting the question from, from people, well, are feelings part of emotion, yes or no? And the answer is, it depends on where you live. Um, so in some parts of the world, emotions are actions. They have nothing to do with feelings at all, which seems preposterous for a Western, it's hard for a Western mind to kind of wrap, you know, wrap around that. Can you but give a quick example it, of what, what, what that looks like? Oh, sure. So, so, give you an action. so um, yeah, so if, um, so in Japan, for example, shame, which in Japan is actually a positive, it's a positive thing to feel. It's not a, it's not a negative thing to feel. It's it, a shame, feeling shame is, or, or sorry, being shameful, I should say, it's not feeling shame, being shameful um, is, um, are actions that you perform to indicate to another person that you have violated a, a rule, usually a relational rule, and that you are very, very, very eager and sincere about trying to rectify that problem. But it, it says nothing about how the person feels inside or what they're thinking. So, it, you know, in, in our culture, if you felt shameful for some bad thing that you did um, and you, um, or let's say you were, you were trying to repair a relationship that you harmed, um, but you didn't actually feel shame, you were just acting to sort of repair things, we would accuse that person of being dishonest, like, you know, because they didn't really feel shameful. They were just trying to like indicate that, you know, they knew they'd done something wrong, um, but they didn't really feel it, you know? And, in but in Japan, um, uh, or at least in certain, in certain cultural contexts in Japan, um, feeling is irrelevant. It's, you know, if, if, um, if I've been, if I, you know, if you and I are related in some way, and I did something that um, was not looked upon well and evaluated negatively, and I brought shame on our family, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. I, if I act to rectify that problem, then I am acting shameful, and that is means I am in a shameful state. So there's no feeling. It, it just doesn't. It's not that. It's not that people are thought to not feel, it's just feeling is not thought to be relevant to, um, and you know, we've studied um, in my lab, we've gone to Africa, we've studied um, the Himba who are um, semi-pastoralists who live in um, Northwestern Namibia near the Angola border. And we've also studied the Hadza who are hunter gatherers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Tanzania. And they also in these cultures have um, similar, you know, that emotions are, are, are sequences of actions that you perform in particular situations to make yourself predictable to other people. So those people will be predictable to you. And there's, there's, they, they practice what is described um, by anthropologists as something called opacity of mind, which means I might, I want to be able to predict your actions. So I know what you're going to do next so that I know what I should do next, but I'm not making any inferences about your state of mind or what you're feeling at all. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not looking at your face and, and using it as a window on your soul. Mm. I, I'm, there's no, um, there's no idea there of like um, reading people's um, emotions from their face or their bodies. The, you know, whereas we in the West, we we have this notion of like um, you even said it, emotion recognition. But mm -hmm. we don't we don't recognize emotions in people. Our brains are inferring; they're making a guess about based on your facial movements and your body posture and your tone of voice and what you just did a moment ago and all your own prior experience. Your brain is making a guess about what the raise of an eyebrow means or the curl of a lip. It's not reading. Right. Movements are not you know are not um, can't be read like words on a page, you're guessing. And um, and in other countries, the idea is that um, it's not even necessary to guess what someone's internal state is because it's right, really right. not relevant. Fascinating. Um, another question from Laszlo. Um, do you have anything to say about octopus distributed brains compared to our central uh, 
process our brains. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith. Oh, I love that work. work yeah. in recent years to, to popularize some of this work. And, uh, so I'd yeah. be curious, as well as Laszlo, to hear what you think about that. Well, I, it, well, Laszlo, I love that work. I think octopuses are incredibly fascinating creatures. Um, it's a, it, Your question's a little uh, um, diffuse, like, but I, you know, because um, there's a lot to say about octopus brains, but I, I think the thing that um, I, I think is really instructive is to remember that octopuses have very, very different, um, their brains are structured incredibly differently from ours. They're capable of incredible complex behavior and intelligence. And this should be a good reminder to us that a big juicy cerebral cortex is not necessary for complex animal behavior. You know, our 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 particular structure brain structure is not the only brain structure that provides the opportunity for complex learning, complex interactions, um, and um, it's just one structure that works particularly well. An octopus, uh, the octopus's um, structure, you know, is a great example of um, what's called integration and uh, uh, segregation and integration. And we have that too, but it just structurally looks differently. So but this should be a lesson to us along with bird brains actually, um, which um, don't have a cerebral cortex. And some birds are capable of tremendous complexity. Even some even have rudimentary, um, their communication has rudimentary properties of language um, that you know, our particular brain structure isn't the only brain structure that, that gives us complex, um, complex behavior and, and intelligence. So next question comes from Celia, and it um, concerns um, how emotions um, can be expressed, um, uh, it, you know, in, in nonverbal forms. She asks, rather than words, could symbols uh, such as the Apple logo or maybe the Christian cross, could could symbols like that act as some sort of shared or common abstractions to communicate emotion concepts. Um, could they be as effective as words in creating or embedding, uh, you know, um, emotion concepts? Well, the really nice thing about words um, is that they usually come with their own context in the form of sentences. Um, and symbols, if symbols come with that kind of a context, then sure. Um, potentially, I mean, any symbol, um, words are symbols too, um, um, but any symbol has the capacity to have a shared meaning. It's just, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not gonna be a universal meaning. So a cross can mean many things, to, even to people who are, are, um, are of, a, of a Christian faith, a cross can mean many things. And it can mean, so some of which are, are very um, pleasant and, and some of which are not. So I think as with words, any kind of symbol derives its meaning in part from shared understanding in a context, in a context. Um, there is no contextless universal um, symbol, like even a smile, for example, can be wonderful or sinister depending on the context so um sure i mean I, I i think words are probably more flexible than symbols in general but they but as i said words are a kind of symbol to begin with so yeah question from uh wallace uh what is the functional relationship between the brain and anxiety great question um there's a lot to say about that but i'll just say something more, more general and that is you know, your brain is in a constant conversation with your body and the world. And it's um, attempting to predict what's gonna happen next to keep you alive and well. That's the most metabolically efficient way to run a body in the world. In fact, to run many systems is to make a prediction and then correct it when necessary. When your brain makes a, a prediction and that prediction is wrong and your brain has to learn something new or when it can't predict very well, for whatever reason, your brain has systems that make it easier to learn that new thing. And those systems involve 
arousal, they involve um, changes that will make you feel jittery and um, alert. Alert maybe to the point of um, distraction. But um, so if you live in an environment that is filled with ambiguity and uncertainty and novelty, for a long period of time, so if it's a short period of time, you'll feel jittery and then it will go away. But if it's persistent, then um, you're gonna be feeling that um, discomfort of that jittery kind of discomfort. And our brains make sense of that in a number of different ways. Um, but the go-to way is anxiety. It doesn't have to be anxiety. Um, so, um, there are other ways to make sense of that jittery feeling, but in general, when it's persistent, the the kind of reflexive way that we make sense of it, that our brains make sense of it, is anxiety. And that that making sense of that jittery feeling as anxiety dictates our behavior, um, which can actually make that jittery feeling persist <laughs> in in ways, as opposed to making sense of it in other ways. So, just to give you a quick example, there's um, research to show that people who experience test anxiety, um, you know, fail tests and they fail courses in college and sometimes they drop out of college because their anxiety is so bad. Um, but they um, learn new concepts, new ways of making sense of that jittery feeling, of making sense of it as say determination to face a challenge. And believe it or not, their study after study after study shows that when students learn this, they not only pass tests, they actually go on to finish their courses and even finish college, which has huge um, implications for their earning capacity later in life. And I'll also say that, you know, even when you're exercising, for example, when you exercise, so you're making a big withdrawal from your body budget, and it's a kind of an investment in the future, but at a certain point, you start to feel really uncomfortable because there's really high arousal. and it, I mean, I feel really uncomfortable, <clears throat> but um, but over time, you you can learn to actually like it. Just like you, you know, when you the first time you ever have coffee, it, and I say this as a devoted coffee drinker for decades. The first time I read coffee, I thought it tasted horrible. But very quickly, my brain associated learned the relationship between that taste and a certain degree of alertness that uh, I found very pleasant. And all of a sudden coffee was delicious for years and years and years. So you'd be surprised actually how um, high arousal unpleasantness can turn to high arousal neutral or even high arousal pleasantness just by the way that your brain makes sense of what it means. So we have time for one more question and it is uh, the following. Um, with our brain wiring to our environment, uh, what are your thoughts on the individual curated experience via social media? Um, wow, well, yeah, here's what I would say. Um, on the one hand, so brains do, wire themselves to their world. And that's that continues to be true throughout your whole life. And to some extent, you know, your brain is, when your brain makes a prediction about what's gonna happen next, it's using your past experiences to, um, it's re-implementing past experiences, um, remembering in a sense, you don't have a conscious sense of remembering, but it's, it's basically re-implementing past um, events in order to predict what's going to happen next. So in a sense, you're, every moment of your life, you're sort of cultivating, continually cultivating your past that will, to some extent, determine who you're going to be in the future, how your brain will predict and how you will act in the future. In the, the way that social media works, like I don't know if you saw the, um, the documentary, The um, Social Dilemma, but that documentary made it really clear that the way social media works on machine learning, with machine learning algorithms, is to serve you up information and experiences that are very similar to um, what you've already experienced. And so this is basically um, 
um, siloing you in along a particular trajectory to what you what you think the world is like. Um, and that's a huge problem, um, as was indicated in that um, in that in that documentary. And it's also a problem that's reinforced by the fact that when the world is predictable to you, it's easier. Metabolically speaking, it's just it's just easier. The two most expensive things your brain can do is move your body and learn something new because learning something new eventually means you know tweaking the the parts like you have to like growing little nubs and more you know like the parts of your brain sort of wire themselves slightly uh, differently to to accommodate that new learning so there's an extra incentive in a sense not to um forage for new information that might be inconsistent with your beliefs or might be novel or might be unexpected because there's a little metabolic cost there. But I guess I would say that um, just like exercise is a uh, an investment, you're making an expenditure uh, that you know you anticipate you will get a return on that investment because if you exercise, it makes it easier for your brain to run a, the budget for your body in the future, which it does. I would say foraging for new information um, is the same thing. It, um, exposing yourself to novelty, exposing yourself to new experiences, even exposing yourself to things that you don't believe in and that might actually challenge your way of thinking is a good investment. Um, it's you're foraging for information, so you're exploring things, but it's a good investment for the future because it makes you more flexible. And when I answer this question when Jamie Ryerson is not here, what I say when people ask me this question is, there is absolutely no excuse for being stuck in a silo in this culture. The New York Times, this is exactly what I say, sorry, Jamie, mm -hmm. but this is exactly what I say. The New York Times is one click away, one click away, and the front page is free. Now that's not true of the wash of of the um, Wall Street Journal, which I wish it were. But there are other newspapers that you can you know that you can you can look at Fox News. You can look at um, lots of other sources. So wherever you are on the political spectrum, whatever your beliefs are. Whatever your stripes are, you are one click away from um, exposing yourself to information that will expand your horizons. It's it's an investment, just like um, exercise. And I explain in the in seven half lessons why that is an important lesson to to think about. Um, uh, to you know, to to consider um, adding um, to your um, to your life. Fantastic, fantastic. Hey, Jane. All, all right. Well, any final words before we conclude for the evening? If I start no. talking, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to thank our audience. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And I want to thank both um, Lisa and James for being with us this evening. If you enjoyed this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. We hope you'll consider making a donation as your support will allow us to continue to provide events just like this one. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Lisa's book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. And um, we were talking before the event started and it's the book is literally hot off the presses. It's been out for all of what, like 36 hours now. So um, now's your chance to get it when it's, it's right off the presses. Um, and again, thank you everybody for being here. We hope